Hello, I'm Chai Hoffelenia. Joining us today is Health Secretary Enrique Ona. With measles cases on the upsurge in Metro Manila, the Health Department is stepping up a campaign to eliminate this infectious viral disease by 2017. The mass immunization starts September and will target 13 million children nationwide. Secretary Ona will speak to us about the state of public health in the Philippines. Good afternoon, Secretary Ona. Good afternoon, um, child. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Well, it's um, a pleasure. Yes. Um, it's, been, it's been in the news of late um, that the, the Department of Health is targeting um, measles-free Philippines by, by 2017. Is that possible? Well, maybe the term uh, measles-free may be uh, a... Uh, a sort of a difficult situation to, to achieve mm -hmm. but certainly uh, we would like that the Philippines would be able to eliminate missiles as a public health uh, problem mm -hmm. by 2017 mm -hmm. and the reason for that is because uh, yes we now have vaccines yeah. that can protect uh, our children and of course the entire population but uh, uh, making everybody, or making it, uh, as you said, uh, missiles free, maybe, uh, so I would call it an overstatement, but certainly uh, that is a target that we would like to achieve. I think there was um, mm. a clarification that was made um, to, to define further what, what missiles free meant or means. Mm -hmm. um, I, and I don't know still if, if this is something that's, that's doable. That a population of about 100 million, you would have no more than 100 people uh, infected with, with measles. Well, that would be uh, a uh, reasonable target. Mm -hmm. But certainly th not to say that it is entirely free or measles free. But as I said, to remove it as a public health uh, danger or a public health uh, um, problem mm -hmm. that can occur. Is this something that, uh, well, several causes have been, have been mentioned, um, primarily migration. Uh, are there other, other reasons for it, for the spread of measles? Oh yes, as a matter of fact, uh, some people now consider measles as part of our climate change. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because there is uh, a, uh, a kind of a relationship in terms of uh, a weather uh, pattern wherein there is uh, a resurgence of this disease and it usually occurs uh, well both in uh, a rainy season as well as in a dry season mm -hmm. and so our effort really is to make sure that we are able to monitor it as regularly and uh, as closely as possible so that if there is a so-called outbreak mm -hmm. and let me define what an outbreak really means yeah. meaning that if you have let's say one case in a particular community in the past let's say one or two years mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you find out that you now have three or four or even two or three or four cases compared to a certain period compared to the previous year or previous years then you may call it an outbreak and so therefore you have to take a look at your uh, population as to why uh, there is such a so-called outbreak. Um, health services have already been devolved um, to local government units and I imagine that you would need um, very, very competent um, health officials at, at the local government level. Um, are, they, are they equipped? Are they ready to deal with situations like this? Oh yes, uh, we have uh, a uh, national epidemiology center that monitors on a weekly basis uh, selected uh, um, infectious diseases, for example, we have regular monitoring yes, of measles, we have regular monitoring, for example, dengue mm -hmm. and even HIV AIDS and uh, hopefully we'll be able to even expand this monitoring for even our non-communicable diseases. But certainly for communicable diseases, it's an important uh, information that national government should have mm -hmm. regularly. What would, you, uh, what would you identify to be the, um, the areas that need monitoring so far as the measles uh, problem is concerned? Well, we know very well that in the Philippines, uh, for example, in 2011, uh, after our national uh, program of uh, Im trying to immunize all the children, uh, we were able to achieve something like 85% of the population uh, uh, 
being immunized, meaning of the children mm -hmm. that needs to be immunized. And so there is always the difficulty of certain population groups yeah. or, uh, or certain difficulties in, in any national program. So as I said, 85% is, and even 90% may be a fairly uh, good uh, achievement already. So you always have this 10% that may not be immunized so you will have, uh, as, as a year goes on, you will always have maybe an increase of this certain number of children mm -hmm. that are immu not, not immunized. And so therefore, uh, when you have, let's say, certain disasters like what we have during the last Yolanda. four months, mm -hmm. then you may have uh, an outbreak. Mm -hmm. And certainly you should recognize right, right away if there is an outbreak and uh, try to do what you call a catch-up uh, immunization program, mm -hmm. which we are doing right now. As a matter of fact, following the Sambuanga episode, yes. uh, the uh, um, earthquake in Bohol, as well as the Yolanda thing, we right away had a, an immunization uh, um, program to immunize all of the children in those particular areas, and even the older uh, vulnerable children, because a good number of those children we knew were not immunized um, during the past of years. late uh, I think a lot of the areas in the national capital region have been have been identified as areas where you have a lot of measles cases well, why is that well let's call it an outbreak okay yes an outbreak meaning that comparatively speaking a number of cases have been reported Com more case or uh, cases were reported in those areas where no cases were reported during the past uh, two years mm -hmm. or maybe uh, even more than or three, four, five or even more cases. And of course, uh, that's difficult to, to tell you. I can tell you exactly what was the cause. But uh, we know very well that, uh, yes, we have, as a matter of fact, a planned program of national immunization in September this year. Yes. So. Uh, because probably of climate change and other air and other events like for example and these are just conjectures mm -hmm. these are not proven we have because of these various disasters in the south yeah a good number of those children or families may have transferred to manila to migration and through migration and uh, you know uh, there are a number of uh, areas in the Philippines who may achieve, who have not achieved the 85% and a good number of the children were not uh, immunized and so therefore they are prone mm -hmm. to, to measles and probably they caught up with the, the virus and may have spread it already. So the only way to, to address a, an outbreak is really through mass vaccination? That's right. Um, there's a question, there's a related question here from, from social media from Atita Love 13 uh, She asks, did DOH oversee municipal health councils to ensure booster shots were given or at least encouraged? Every, uh, every year, it's a continuous uh, effort of national government to inform the local government mm -hmm. uh, that there is always this danger of, of uh, children catching up missiles. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is, it is a disease that's always there. It may be one, two or three cases, but it's always there. We have not really eliminated it. So there is always a continuing campaign. Mm -hmm. And so as uh, we earlier discussed, it's very important that you get that data when there is uh, right away a, a uh, suspected measles case. And as a matter of fact, uh, we had already earlier reports of, uh, of some outbreak even in August, and this is expected. Mm -hmm. uh, we, as I said, measles is not a disease that we have totally eliminated. So we monitor it, uh, and uh, we always advise uh, local governments to have a, a um, immunization program updated or even uh, uh, aggressively implemented when there is a report of missiles in their particular area. There has been, um, I think, a recommendation by Congressman Doilia Chon. He, he filed a resolution, I believe, and he said that there should be more um, 
cooperation or partnership between the Department of Health and, and the private sector. That the, the, the OH should not just be reactionary and addressing problems or outbreaks as, as they occur. Right. Is this something that you're, you're open to? or? Of course, we work very closely and all the time with the private sector. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of degree. Mm -hmm. So in short, uh, especially today, you know, as I essentially came from the private sector and have been among those espousing a closer work relationship with the private sector. So uh, with due respect to the congressman, uh, maybe you should uh, also be aware that we are indeed very open to uh, cooperation and partnership with the private sector. But I think that um, what, what he's proposing was um, something that's more institutionalized, uh, that you set up a bureau and uh, a board of health, uh, health education where the private sector would be involved and can sit down with, with government. We but do this that. is something that's not, that's not it's existing not necessary. right now? It's not necessary. Why is that? Well, as I said, we, we always have uh, a very uh, close coordination with and, uh, and uh, partnership with the private sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'd like to, uh, yes, go uh, ahead. Putting in a board or a so-called council mm -hmm. is something that uh, is very common in, in medicine, whether it is in the combination of the public and private sector. Mm -hmm. There's another <coughs> question here, this time on dengue. Um, this is from Neil Mamaklai. The DOH recently employed what they claim to be the most cost-effective mechanism against dengue. This is done by means of informing people and tapping local government units. At this point, what is the success rate of the program? What, when you are talking of success rate, what, what is it talking of percentage? Is asking of percentage? Because I guess if you've, if you've set up targets, have, have you met those targets at, at the sure. very least? We have a program in the Department of Health where in uh, through texting, mm -hmm. uh, if let's say a health center has a case of dengue, mm -hmm. um, they they should text it right away to their health or to their health center, uh, and to the uh, to their health uh, official because this health is devolved, you see. Yes. So they have their either the city health officer or their municipal health officer, and so that it should right away be. Uh, uh, um, given to the local government, meaning to the barangay, so that that health center, that health, that barangay is identified right away. And, uh, so you get health, quick feedback. And the health center, the, the health authorities would know right away and therefore would have the, would necessarily right away get in touch with the barangay captain mm -hmm. so that uh, that area or that school uh, that where that patient may have uh, may come from is right away identified and make the necessary intervention mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, make the necessary uh, control. But again, that will depend on the the competence and the skill of um, the health officers or officials at the local level. Correct. Are there problematic areas in different parts of the country which you, you could identify no, where I, you, you hope that health services would be, would be more accessible and um, would be more effective? Oh, uh, I don't think I can identify you in a specific province or, or community, but certainly uh, we have uneven, uneven uh, um, levels of uh, information and uh, and capacity for our local governments. That's exactly one of the difficulties we have because mm -hmm. health, health, you know, health reporting and healthcare, like for example, dengue, is really a local health government responsibility. And uh, the, the role of the national department or the, the, the national government here through the Department of Health is to, to make sure that uh, this information is right away collated and uh, necessary advice is given to that particular local government as well as even assistance if needed. I think one of the problems also that, well devolution is a, is a good thing but um, some of the problems that have also arisen as a result of devolution is corruption. Um, and I think you've probably heard about this, um, especially in 
procurement of medicines to, to address certain certain diseases and certain sicknesses. Um, what is the department, what is the DOH doing to address this? Well, as a matter of fact, we, rather than looking at it on a so-called case-to-case basis, we are actually uh, uh, in a situation right now wherein we have, uh, we're coming out with a recommendation with regards to the devolution of healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, we are even preparing right now, and I might even tell you now, that we are preparing for a, uh, a bill in Congress mm -hmm. wherein we we will recommend that let's say the provincial health officer and maybe even the municipal health officer be directly uh, under the Department of Health. You see the devolution oh. of health is such that the responsibility of public health and even hospital care in a particular province is under the responsibility of the governor. Right. And in a particular town, it is the responsibility of the mayor. Mm -hmm. And so... It can be, it can right become very political. This, yes. It commonly is a very political issue because the provincial health officer gets his salary from the governor and can be changed by the governor mm -hmm. every time there's a new, you know, a new governor for that right. matter. There is no, um, there is no so-called uh, um, permanency mm -hmm. in their job. And that kind of makes things difficult uh, because you can have, like the Department of Health, we have our policy-making body as well as supervisory and monitoring uh, responsibility. Uh, but if you have, let's say, a local executive, whether it's a governor or mayor, who may not put health as, priority. as his main, as a major priority for one reason or another, mm. then uh, that is where certain problems may ensue. When do you um, plan to come up with this recommendation? As a matter of fact, we have we have a bill uh, being uh, crafted now for, for that. As a matter of fact, I have had that impression already, even from the very start, uh, even before I became uh, Secretary of Health. Yeah. But of course, uh, you have to take a look, and I, have more, I had more time and uh, uh, time to observe and see how this uh, situation, because certainly devolution had also its good points. Mm -hmm. Uh, it the, it puts uh, the local officials uh, direct responsibility and ownership yeah. to the to the uh, result of the health care and health system. In and they would know the local situation best. Would, so so there there should be that kind of balance. Mm. And so uh, despite my initial so-called bias on the on the devolution. Mm -hmm. I, I had to make sure that indeed my observation is based on certain what I call, uh, you know, scientific data. Empirical if I call data. That, uh, not empirical anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so your, your suspicions were validated? In general, I would rather that the uh, provincial health officer, that's what we call the PHO, and the municipal health officer be directly under the Department of Health, mm -hmm. which they are not as of today. That would entail um, adjustments in so far as pay is concerned? Yes, so because that would mean, uh, well, actually I have made already an initial uh, calculation. It would mean something like 1.2 to 1.4 billion pesos. Uh, that will not be included or that will be absorbed by the by the Department of Health, by the national government oh, for the but, salaries. But you had a, the <coughs> largest budget increase for, for 2014. Um, for this year, you, I, if, if, these figures are, if these figures are correct, you got 84 billion pesos as compared to 53 billion pesos last year. So that's uh, roughly about 58% increase in, in budget. That's correct, but you know, you should also look at where did that budget go to. 
where did you spend or and where do you intend to spend no, the additional uh, out sums? Out of that budget, the increase, the, the most major increase there is in the coverage of our poor for, our, for their health insurance. Uh. From an initial budget or from a 2013 budget of 12.5 billion pesos mm -hmm. uh, that enrolls about 5.2 million families, mm -hmm. poor families. And these are our very poor Filipino families. Mm -hmm. Or that is, a po that is a population of about 23 to 25 million Filipinos. As of today, that number has been increased to 14.7 million families mm -hmm. or a budget of about 35.4 uh, billion pesos. So thanks to syntax. That's right. <laughs> and that, you know, to me, that is the most significant, the made a um, very major uh, reform in the national healthcare system of the country. And I'm very certain that w within this year, the next couple of years, you will see major changes in the health system of the country. Because now, those poor or even the so-called very near poor families, mm. because we are now talking of almost of more than 50 million Filipinos who will now be covered, automatically be covered by health insurance. That's good news. That is uh, subsidized by the national government. Mm -hmm. These are really the Filipinos that uh, heretofore had to shell out always something from their own pocket mm -hmm. when they get sick. And a good number of them, I'm sure in the past, would not even go to a hospital anymore because they know that they won't be able to afford the, care, the cost of care. You had and today, they can do that yeah. Because the program also of our of PhilHealth, which is our national health insurance, also has introduced what we call case rates, mm -hmm. meaning that when they get sick that needs hospitalization and they are admitted in the hospital, they don't have to shell out any out-of-pocket expense. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, I'm sure for those listening right now, they will call you. <laughs> and tell you that they were admitted a couple of weeks and they, or that they had to pay something. That they had to pay something. Yeah. Well, when we are talking of major reforms, sometimes it takes time for either the public to understand that and know about their their rights or benefits, but at the same time, also even in the hospital system, because I'm talking not only of Department of Health hospitals, mm -hmm. but we're but also the so-called LGU hospitals, mm -hmm. meaning these are the uh, provincial and district hospitals. Um, there's a, in, in relation to um, syntaxes, there's also another question <coughs> from um, <coughs> Irene Patricia Garcia. She asks, how much fund will DOH allocate to tobacco control from the revenues of tobacco and alcohol tax? Is that, is that under your... Your wing? Well, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have a program already started and quite a while ago mm -hmm. by the Lung Center of the Philippines as a unit for smokers to be helped trying oh. to, uh, to, for them to, uh, to, to kick uh, the habit. escape the habit. Mm -hmm. However, just like anything else, well, maybe in, uh, putting it in another way, in, in, in any person trying to or wishing to stop smoking, that desire and that determination must come from him, from himself. If you are looking for a, uh, a so-called uh, strategy to stop smoking through some other means, meaning outside of your own desire to stop smoking, yeah. you, won't, you won't succeed. So you've got to be determined to really uh, wish uh, to stop. And that's, that's the major difference in, in trying to remove the habit of smoking. 
Isn't it quite of a problem that the DOH is trying to push an anti-smoking um, well campaign and you have the president having difficulty kicking the habit himself? Well, it just shows to you that it's a problem. Mm -hmm. That really getting, that uh, making people stop smoking is, is not that easy. And that's the reason why we look at various strategies and that's the reason why the base, the fundamental strategy of the syntax is not so much even among the smokers already because we know it's so hard, mm -hmm. especially the, uh, the, the adult smokers or the, even the, the, um, the middle-aged smokers. Mm -hmm. What we are really targeting is to prevent, is to raise the cost of the cigarette so that the young boys, or even I will call it children, the young boys and girls who stops, who st seems to be, you know, to start, uh, either they're introduced to smoking by their friends or by pakikisama. Uh, and this is usually when they're in their 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, if you raise the tax and the cigarette gets expensive, then uh, their, the temptation or their, their chance of being able to, to continuously smoke will not be there because, you know, the young boys and girls, their money is based on coming from papa or mama. And if the pocket money is less, yeah. I, I mean, if the, if the cigarette So you make it less accessible, less accessible to them. Accessible, yeah. There's a, there's a good follow-up question to that. Uh, this is from at times, times Up Tobacco. They ask, what needs to happen so Pinoy will certify the graphic health warning bill as urgent? No, no, that, that bill has been, uh, that has been already, actually that has been in the Senate. Uh, I mean, uh, let's correct it. That graphic uh, initiative mm -hmm. by the Department of Health is actually there in the Supreme Court because there was a TRO that. Yeah. And, and uh, we know also very well that to me, the best way to, to really uh, reduce smoking is what I, I mentioned to you, raise the cost, mm -hmm. especially by making it less accessible to the young. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I strongly support a higher tax. Yes. And that's, uh, if you have higher taxes, then you have more funds to, um, to, to spend for field health programs. And other things. And even to, as I said, and uh, so in short, it's really a combination of, uh, of raising the revenue. Yes. Uh, that has been, uh, that can be used to improve our healthcare system. But at the same time, uh, also uh, reduce the access of the young uh, for cigarettes, for cheap cigarettes. Okay, I'd just like to jump to HIV because um, this is the second time this has come up. Um, question is from at Dune Glam, what can LGUs and the private sector do about increasing HIV cases? I've also uh, uh, propose a bill in Congress right now mm -hmm. to uh, amend our existing law on HIV to um, make it essentially mandatory for uh, case uh, uh, for for cases to be reported. That is already mandatory right now, but I would like to include a stricter uh, requirement for contact tracing. Mm -hmm. You see the law, the Philippine law on HIV is essentially to protect the so-called uh, privacy. And that's yeah. good. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. I don't object to that. But in protecting that privacy, you want to make sure that the uh, danger of spread is not um, adversely affected mm -hmm. and so it's very important that when you are talking of a public health disease wherein you want to control the spread that you want to make sure that for people who are exposed 
then they should be reported so that they can be properly advised mm -hmm. to take the necessary either test so uh, so that they can be uh, advised if indeed they are infected or not yeah uh, let me explain that even further because mm -hmm. i don't want to be misunderstood about that aspect about 80 percent of the hiv aids cases in the philippines today are contracted or con are get the infection mm -hmm. from males from male sexual partners okay that infects another male mm -hmm. so if let's say one of those males therefore had a contact with another male it spreads and that particular one of that part partners eventually found out to be uh, infected i think it is obligatory and necessary that those he had uh, sexual contact should be informed that they have had contact with somebody who is infected. That's what we call contact tracing. Mm -hmm. That is fundamental in a public health disease, right? So you want to require this? That's right. Do you expect, yes, because of privacy <coughs> concerns, there, there might be resistance here or it might yes. not be as effective? Yes. But the important thing is to make sure that privacy is still, it can be, is still protected. So I'm, I have nothing, I have no quarrel about privacy. Mm -hmm. It is just that uh, we must be very, we should be more vigilant. And, be more, and actually right now, that's my, uh, my uh, so-called order to our public health workers. But I think that has to be supported by a more, a stronger law that really makes sure that it is well that is well uh, um, enunciated and uh, well understood by the public. I Maybe just uh, a couple more of um, questions, just um, one point about um, causes of mortality and causes, the leading causes of morbidity um, in the country. And when I was looking at some of the, some of the diseases, these are actually quite common diseases like heart, pneumonia, cancer, TB, diabetes for, for, for mortality. Um, apparently, Filipinos are infected with diseases that, uh, that have to do with either the heart or, or the lungs. Mm -hmm. um, and these are quite preventable and, and treatable. Well, let me put it this way. All of us will die, right? And you will die of something. Mm -hmm. And through the years, the life expectancy of the Filipino, the Filipinos actually is increasing. So when you really look at it at a macro level, the Filipinos' life expectancy is getting longer, longer and longer. Mm -hmm. For example, for a child born today, our life expectancy is about already 72 years, okay? It's probably even higher if we get the more recent counting for those that are born today. Mm. So in short, it's the reasons because uh, we have been able to uh, uh, solve a lot of infectious diseases, except of course, we, that's why we try to um, target the poor because it's, it's this population that unfortunately is still uh, gets most of these so-called infectious diseases. But uh, going back to, to, to what you said, our effort now is to, to make sure that we are able to educate through a massive, through what we call a, a um, more aggressive public information system. Mm -hmm. But information is not enough because our so-called common Non-communicable diseases are heart disease, mm. cancer, strokes, hypertension, lifestyle. diabetes, lifestyle. Yeah, lifestyle diseases. But at the other at the other side of the coin, for the poor, they also they still have the danger of infectious diseases like TB, yeah. um, you know, leptospirosis, and um, malaria mm -hmm. so we are what we call a population based on certain segments of the population 
endangered by what we call double burden mm -hmm. of disease, both infectious and non and non communicable or non infectious diseases. But for the I'd call the forty percent of the population, the bigger problem is communica is non communicable diseases. Mm -hmm. When you look at the poor, you have both mm -hmm. non communicable and communicable diseases. So again in short our effort really in the Department of Health is to, to make sure that we address all of these programs, mm -hmm. uh, both on a national scale, but at the same time also targeting certain population groups. Because we are, the secretary, we are the Department of Health for the whole country. Right. You have a few years left. What will be your, um, I guess, your priorities or what would you want to, to leave behind before you, you exit as health secretary? Four areas. Mm -hmm. The first was to make sure that we give our population, the entire population, protection from financial uh, catastrophe when they get sick, meaning, therefore, mm -hmm that they are covered, and that's why uh, our health insurance, and especially with the passage of the same tax, yeah. has, we have more or less achieved that. I expect that by the end of this year, 2014, we will be able to achieve more than 90%. Well, all that's what we, we are, we will be able to achieve real, what I call real. So 90% coverage? Yes, for, for health insurance. Okay. Now, of course, the next, the next priority there is how to expand the benefits for those that are covered. Mm -hmm. Of course, that will, in, that will involve uh, studies on actuarial science to see how far the premium that we have right now for our, that our government uh, pays for our sponsored uh, families, as well as for those in the formal sector. Mm -hmm. Uh, how far can that cover to expand as much as possible the coverage? Right. The second the is third. no second mm -hmm. because that's financial risk protection okay. through through uh, expansion of our health insurance, mm -hmm. so that we will achieve one hundred percent or almost one hundred percent coverage. Yeah. The next is to improve our health facilities mm -hmm. because if you have coverage of your people but your health facilities are not at par or cannot give you the services that are, that are needed or you don't have the, the staff that will take care of the patients, then uh, you look, you know, the other side of the coin is not, is not fulfilled. Yeah. So to me, those are the two most important ones. And so in doing that, mm -hmm. uh, our third priority is to really uh, and this is just a monitoring thing. Mm -hmm. And how do we know that we are successful in that? Yeah. The third one is to make sure that we achieve our so-called targets of our Millennium Development Goals. Mm -hmm. But I said, by doing those things, two things, we should be able to achieve our Millennium Development Goals. And our MDGs essentially are, are uh, targets like our maternal Mortality. Yes, decreasing that. Uh, we use. Uh, we should have. A dec we should have less and less of our mothers mm -hmm. dying from childbirth. Right. Why? Why was that? Why was it chosen? Why was maternal mortality chosen mm -hmm. as a uh, so-called target? Because it measures very uh, quite indirectly the ca the quality of your healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? By measuring the number of mothers dying. Yes. And since about 50% of our people are very poor and therefore they deliver either at home or in a rural health unit, we have already a program ongoing for a number of years mm -hmm. making, uh, uh, or making sure that they deliver in a health facility, mm. meaning not anymore at home yeah. and not anymore from a HELOT but really in a health facility, at least in a rural health unit with a, with a midwife or a nurse. Mm -hmm. And that if there is any problem with that pregnancy, that they can be right away 
uh, brought to a rural, to a community to, or to a district hospital or a provincial hospital okay. for let's say cesarean section. So that measures the quality of care. Yeah, and your last uh, the last target for the year for for the, the for the one. yes the fourth one that we will be able to achieve already con so-called connectivity okay. through IT okay. improvement of our health of our uh, of our uh, computer system okay. IT. Thank you very much, Secretary. Uh, we have been speaking with Health Secretary Enrique Ona about the department's campaign to eliminate measles in the Philippines and the state of public health in the country. I'm Chai Hofilenia. Thanks for joining us.